This is Success Beyond the Score, giving insights and tips to help you learn how to build your music career from the best in the field by Millicent Stevenson. Millicent is a multi-award winning saxophonist and endorser of Harry Hartman's Fiber Reads. She is currently serving on the Executive Committee of the Musicians' Union. With over 40 years experience in the creative industry, Millicent has honed her performance and business skills. She provides personal development training and coaching via her online platform, successbeyondthescore.com. Hi, and welcome to Success Beyond the Score. I'm Millicent Stevenson, and thank you so much for joining me today. Now, my guest is Abigail Kelly. She is an international operatic soprano. She's the ambassador for National Touring Opera. She's been featured in various journals. She's a vocal tutor and a workshop leader. By the way, you will notice a slight difference in the sound quality of the interview. That's because at the moment, because of coronavirus and social distancing requirements, the interview took place using Zoom over the internet, but the content is A+. Here is Abigail Kelly. My surprising thing about you is that you're a black female operatic soprano. I think you're the first black female operatic soprano I've ever met. I know it sounds like, gosh, where's she living? But (laughs) when I met you a few years ago, I was like, a black woman sings opera? Really? (laughs) I was like, you know, and it's like, so strange but you know as as the years have rolled on I've met one or two others but you were the first impression of that genre in my mind and so the first thing I wanted to ask even though it's going to put all my questions upside down is why did you choose to be an operatic soprano not a pop singer not a jazz singer but an operatic soprano why did you go for that I'm I'm just fascinated (laughs) um well I think it's Probably because I, I, I don't. I, to be honest, I didn't choose that path immediately. It wasn't something that was totally thought out from the get go that that's exactly what I was going to do. I knew that I wanted to perform. I didn't know what type of performance that was going to be. I did a lot of music when I was little and my parents took me to see so many different types of theatrical events so they took me to the ballet they took me to uh, the opera I saw my first opera when I was about nine eight nine Uh, they took me to see um, uh, you know sports things that just anything that they could take me to they did which was great and I played the piano when I was little, I played the violin, I went to a dance school, I went to the local church choir. So my life growing up was extremely focused on um, performance things, you know, performance-based activities. And it wasn't really until I got to my A-levels when I decided having studied I was studying uh, chemistry and biology and I wanted to go into scientific research and I just said to myself you know I can't I cannot do that without feeling some way that I've cheated myself out of an experience and out of an opportunity to do what I really truly love which was performance Uh, and it wasn't until I got into I got into music college I wanted to you know study the voice uh, and I, it was in my year, sort of third year, we did a lot of um, uh, leader, art song, German song, classical repertoire, we did lots of musical theatre, uh, just ev- everything that you could think of. It wasn't until in my third year, really, that I went, you know what, I really loved the challenge of opera. First and foremost, I just, the, the challenge, vocal acrobatics the everything that you have to do to make sure that you are totally uh on point every single time that you have to deliver every single occasion that you perform I I loved that I'm not saying that that's not the case for everything else but there is a there is a high level of expectation and standard in terms of singing and technique that is involved that has to be consistently accurate yeah. and I loved that I loved that idea of being able to do something like that so that's yeah. why I 
I went down that route instead of musical theatre. Now, musical theatre has its own own elements of difficulty and the stamina that you need to be able to do eight shows a week, that relentless sort of um, physical aspect of it. You know, it has similarities to opera, but it was really the the difficulty of it that I that drew me to opera, which sounds crazy, isn't it? it sounds absolutely mad. I like to give myself a hard time, really, is what I like to do. So, for example, um, one of the operas that I've been in before, uh, called The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart, is about three hours long. And the role that I usually play in that opera is the, the lead female role. And she is in every single scene of that opera pretty much she has a, a bit in act one where she disappears and then she comes back on again and then she's in it forever yeah. it act two she yeah. never leaves she leaves the stage once and then comes back on again and then she gets a bit more of a, a sort of time off in in act three but and then act four it kind of ramps up again and it's just it's it's physically demanding it's technically demanding mm -hmm. not only as an opera singer do you have to know what you are singing and usually in a different language so in the marriage of figaro for example i perform that in italian i would have to oh, okay. sing it in italian understanding word for word what i am singing at any point in time so I can't just mimic the sounds and just go mimic this sound and then look sad I have to know exactly what I am saying at any given moment yeah. but not only do I need to know exactly what I'm saying yeah I also have to know exactly what anybody else on stage with me at that time is also saying so that's three hours worth of Italian in your head, yeah. three hours worth of music in your head that you've got to memorize. There's no music in front of you. You don't have the score, you don't have a script. Yeah. It is it is mental gymnastics, it really, really is. And I, I, I'm, very, um, I'm very weird in that I like memorizing things. <laughs> so that's something that I really, really enjoy about really difficult opera yeah. know, memorizing stuff and seeing if you can challenge yourself to go all the way from one scene to the next scene going yeah, yeah I know exactly what I'm doing <laughs> and you know it just has to be on point every single time you do it um yeah so that's that's some of the challenges obviously as well you have extremes of register when you're singing opera so I'm a lyric colorator I kind of there are many different types of opera singer and uh, we've been very much in a world of um, you are this type of opera singer, this is what it's called, and this is the rep that you do. Don't do anything else because everybody else will be confused. And I don't particularly subscribe to that in its entirety because okay. I feel like if I can sing, if I can sing whatever it is well and I'm bankable and, uh, you know, put onable in that role, I should just be able to do it. So I'm what is traditionally called a lyric coloratura soprano, but I also sing, um, that means uh, I sing long lines, but then I burst into some like really quick zippy, a um, uh, lot of melismas, think Mariah Carey, that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, but super, super high, like yeah. really high. Yeah. Um, but then I also sing soubrette roles, which aren't as, aren't as high. Um, they're kind of like the... The, the maids, the the kind of fun, happy go lucky characters. Uh, so yeah, those are the those are the sorts of things that I do. But yeah, range your register is very important to make sure that it's an yeah. even instrument from top to bottom. There's so yeah. many things. You know, I sing in Russian, I sing in French, German, Italian. Um, I've done operas in yeah, I've done operas in Spanish. Uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of language skill mental gymnastics and so, then also uh, remembering where you are supposed to be on stage <laughs> and hitting your light it's all it's all of the above it's I love it so my my languages are all right I I get on fine in Italy actually um mm. I think that I have I think all singers all opera singers have an affinity with a certain language that yeah. they really really love to sing in and therefore they're really passionate about uh, speaking in as well 
And I love Italian. I think Italian is a fantastic language. Um, I love how it forms in the mouth and the sounds that it makes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, being in Italy, I'm absolutely fine. I can pick up the language. I, I understand a lot more than I can say, uh, but I'm, I'm able to get by. Similarly in Germany, I'm all right. Again, I can understand more than I can speak, but my French is awful. My, my spoken French is not good. Uh, yeah, when it comes on to past tense and stuff like that, it's no, 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 no. I, will, yeah. I would rather yeah. sing to yeah. somebody in French. So, I mean, I was reading online that you're an ambassador and you've been featured in Black Hair, Beauty and Hair magazine and so on. So you said earlier on that as an opera singer, there's certain boxes that you should fit in, but you don't. You cross over and do different things. So how would you describe yourself now in terms of your music career? I describe myself as a, uh, an opera singer, vocal tutor, workshop leader and ambassador for the belief that opera is for absolutely every single person out there and it's not for any one type of person um so that's mm -hmm. that's how i see myself um at the moment i've been doing lots of uh operas for young people i've done it all my career actually uh but it's mm -hmm. it's it's something that i'm really passionate about and i've been given the opportunity as a black opera singer to uh you know be the first opera singer full stop that some kids see at all from a very very young age i just did mm. an online opera uh that's aimed at uh really really young kids like two plus and i'm going to be doing okay. another opera coming up that's aimed for re babies so mm. there will be a set of children who are growing up right now whose first experience of an operatic singer is a mm -hmm. black female which i think is fantastic because that just normalizes the fact that opera is is for everybody and everyone yes. can do it if they you know possess the the skills to do so at the moment i i'm i'm really thinking about the the barriers that have been that are in place um that are in place for higher education full stop to be honest with you at the moment you know um it it takes a lot of money to go to mm. music college. It takes a lot of money to go to university full stop. So, you know, there are barriers out there um, for, for young people to get into this industry. But I'm, I'm out here to hopefully show that if you, you know, if you can find funding, if you can find a singing tutor, if you can find a mentor, if, if, if you really want to, jump on board this wonderful thing that is opera then you know there is a you you can you can it is for you so that's that's where I see myself right now that's my my career mm. right now oh wonderful so are you a full-time musician or full-time singer I am yes oh. I am wonderfully um I don't really do much else <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning of the lockdown, you know, this year, I yeah. uh, I sort of uh, sat down with myself and had a little chat with myself yeah. as I as I often do. I like to do that every now and then. And I just went now. You can either continue doing what you're doing oh. or we don't know how this is going to play out. Should I retrain should I think about going into a, a different sector should I go into education um and I think that thought lasted for all of two and a half minutes and <laughs> then I realized that I I love what I do and there is nothing in this world that is going to stop me from mm. from doing that um yeah. so yeah yeah full time it's beautiful and it's wonderful you know it's so it's it's really, um, I feel blessed to be able to say that I am a full-time musician. That is something that is very diff difficult uh, mm -hmm. to be able to say that you, like all your income is based on, on either teaching music or performing music. Uh, and I, I feel so lucky to be able to say that I, that's what I do. So. Oops, just dropped my phone there. Sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> just dropped on my lap. I was listening. I was just keeping an eye on the time as well because I know you you had a, to go off. But um, I'm still interested in in the way we are now. I mean, you are a full time musician. But what was the journey for you as a full time musician? How did you sort of build up yourself to become a full time musician? I mean, obviously you've mentioned you you, you did your degree. Um, but then, then what happened? Well, I did my degree at Birmingham Conservatoire. That was about four years. Whilst I was doing my degree, I, you know, sang as a you know, student, part-time musician, uh, singing for weddings, funerals, engagements, uh, some concerts. I learned how to put on my own concerts and uh, went and did some more study and then didn't go down the route that is sort of prescribed to you to make it as an opera singer. You're supposed to, you're supposed to go to a music college and do a bachelor of music degree, which I did. Then you go and do a postgrad, which I did, but then you go and do a master's, you go to an opera school, which I tried to get onto, but did not. Uh, then you might go to uh, an opera studio like the National Opera Studio in the UK or any of the opera studios in like, Germany, Switzerland. Uh, that was not my path. I wasn't, I wasn't vocally ready. I wasn't vocally there yet to, to jump on that path. Uh, so I ended up very fortunately working for an opera company straight out of music college, straight out of my postgraduate degree. Mm. which meant that I sort of treated that like my continuation of study. Uh, yeah. And I was by no means like a full-time musician then. I was very much, I'd, I'd get this little bit of work there and then I'd have two, three months uh, where I would be, you know, back in Birmingham doing my, you know, teaching at the schools that I teach, teaching privately, and then I'd go off again to uh, to another gig for another couple of months. So not, not you know bang 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 like okay. it is right now yeah. um and I just I just plugged away at it and just kept on going at it I was extremely fortunate as well that I have uh parents who supported me a hundred percent you know a hundred percent behind what I was doing mm. um and that I you know did I had teaching as well that I could fall back and and the balance between teaching being my main source of income and performing being my main source of income has always, you know, yeah. there's been a little balance in terms of that. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's just, I, I found a, one particular opera company that saw potential in me, decided that they were going to throw a lot of support behind me, enabled me to, uh, you know, be in, be in their main stage operas, be in uh, operas for children, do workshopping. And the more and more experience I gained in those three different strands, mm. the, the more and more I was confident enough to, you know, work with other people and say, look, this is what I do. This is what I can achieve. And, you know, hire me because why, why wouldn't you? Um, that sounds so awful. Doesn't it? Why wouldn't you hire me? Come on. But you know, you, you have to, uh, I am hilariously, I am also really uh, backwards in coming forwards with what I have to offer. And I think I've only recently become more forwards about what I do and what I have to okay. offer. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a massive part of, of um, becoming a full-time, whatever it is that you're, you know, whatever it is you're wanting to do, a full-time musician, a full-time mm. um, music producer, studio engineer, uh, full-time music librarian, uh, full-time uh, choir master. You, you get to the point where you look at yourself and you go actually I have a lot to give I have I have talent I have drive determination and I can I conduct myself in a certain way so yeah I'm going to go out there with that energy into the world and hopefully people will pick up on that and employ me so that's that's I think how I have managed to maintain a, a more full-time feeling of a, of a career definitely feels full right now which is great I'm so <laughs> so happy I'm so fortunate I'm really really fortunate um yeah. and then also feeling as well you know balancing that with a sense of feeling fortunate feeling blessed feeling that at any point in time this this you know 
could be taken away from you as we all felt this year so much yeah. was taken away from us all this year and just maintaining well, yeah. that sense of gratefulness for for what you have I think yeah. is an important balance to also have so somehow you've managed to survive so far through lockdown with the COVID has that been the case yeah um I think I'm that the Mm, carry on no go on no you go on no 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 so what about you you go first yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, rabbit 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 um I think when the when the lockdown started uh I was due as you know I was due to get married uh this year mm. and there were, uh I'd gotten to the point actually sort of the whole of 2018, 2019 was a very, very busy couple of years for me uh, work-wise. And I was getting to the point at the beginning of this year where I just went, you know what, I'm going to take some time out. I need to take some time for myself, just work on what I need to work on vocally, work on what I need to work on spiritually, physically, health-wise, emotionally. Mm -hmm. And uh, and getting married was... uh, a massive stress, actually. I, I was really quite it stressed is, out about this impending is. wedding situation. Uh, oh, so yeah. when Marriage everything is sort are. of transpired that, you know, things weren't going in the direction with the with the pandemic that we we were kind of looking looking to the you know varying sides of the world, <laughs> watching this kind of flow this way. Um, mm. I was already at a place where I was just like, I need to stop. I need to stop. I can't, I cannot do anything. I just need to, I need to stop. And for the first six weeks of, I'd say actually for the first month of the lockdown, I didn't sing at all. I didn't sing at all. Nothing. I didn't want to. I took a, you know, every time I took a breath in to sing, I would burst into tears. I just, I just didn't want to. The thing about singing is that it ties into your emotional state so, so much. It's focused Mm -hmm. all on breath. And if when you breathe in and you key into where you are emotionally and all that comes out is sadness and loss and mourning, you, you just kind of go, I can't, I can't do that to myself right now Mm. um so I found the first you know the first bit of it was was difficult and I tell you what pulled me pulled me out of out of it was actually being able to teach my young pupils via zoom and seeing Mm. all of these younglings who just were like I really want to have my singing lessons I'm really enjoying having singing lessons I was like yeah I'm really enjoying singing with you as well um and then I I ended up you know, I took a breath in one day, sang some spirituals, took another breath in the next day, sang some mid to late 90s rock female driven lead band <laughs> songs, <laughs> Evanescence, My Doubt, No Doubt, all of that sort of stuff. And um, I just went, you know, this is, that's, that's when I went, this is what I have to do. This is, mm. this is how I have to live my life. If I don't sing, then something is missing totally totally missing um and then industry wise we've just all had to adapt you know singing lessons are on zoom workshops are on zoom you know you're doing wonderful things uh with kafemni with the with the group getting people together even though you can't be together um and i've i've been fortunate again enough to have done a few in-person events and i've done a few online performances and I've worked for a couple of companies this year that I would never have thought Mm. that I would ever have worked with so for example I did a a a children's online recital uh, an operatic recital for the Royal Albert Hall which was amazing which was lots of very you know stressful to to do in your own basement all by yourself (laughs) Uh, but just brilliant to be able to work with a with a company like that that I've not actually really worked for or with before uh so opportunities have popped up because of uh Mm. the the situation that we're all in uh that I uh I have been yeah very lucky to have have pop up 
That's actually fantastic. It sounds like although COVID and lockdown has been a negative for many and for all of us, there's been a really positive side to it as well for you and for other musicians that I'm speaking to mm. who, who have managed to. Do you think that's something to do with your personality type, which has just decided that you've got to keep going, you've got to make this work, it is your business, you know, you can't just um, give up and die type thing. Do you think that's something to do with personality? I know there is also the other element of opportunities, but opportunities and some things came together. I don't know if you know what that thing was for you. Do you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure what that thing was for me. I'm a great believer in everything that you do leads you to the next moment. So at the, the, the first thing that I did sort of lockdown wise was a children's, um, a children's singing lesson for English touring opera that went online on YouTube. And from that, I think I then, that's how the Royal, Royal Albert Hall saw me. And oh. a friend of mine who worked there at the Royal Albert Hall, they were looking for somebody else to do one of those recitals. So suggested me, I did that, which then led to, and there, you know, there are, there are things like that, pathways like that, where it's the magic of, YouTube it's the magic of being sort of around and in the ether um, in a way that I never have been before I am very shy about social media I'm not on YouTube really I uh, I took a massive Twitter hiatus as they call it I just came off Twitter at the beginning of the pandemic I just knew that I needed to the only voices that I needed to have around me were the the voice in my head the voices of those immediately around me and I didn't want to have to it sounds really selfish but I I actually just needed some I needed some silence um and time to process things in my own way and sit with my own thoughts and my own feelings uh and wonderfully um that's that's made me feel quite you know, I, yeah. I feel quite chipper and quite confident about what I'm doing. I don't have any sort of like, you're not doing such and such, you're not doing such and such, and this is yeah. what's happening. Um, but at the same time, doing things that do go out into the into the internet and into that ether has enabled more people to see what I do that may never have noticed me before, uh, just because you know I, I wouldn't have been on their on their radar. Mm. So that's that's been an interesting positive thing. That's been yeah. a, yeah. wow, that's great. I mean, I can't wait for part two, and I hope that's the same for you. So join me next time on Success Beyond the Score when Abigail's going to tell us about her career lows, how lockdown impacted her wedding and her work. Um, she's also going to talk about touring and how to sort of balance that fame with the mundane. She's also going to give her five tips to help you build your music career and more and more and more. So tune in next time. And while you're waiting, check out previous episodes, grab yourself uh, a copy of my free e-booklet Revealed, 25 Secrets of the Successful Gigging Musician, Singer, um, Rapper and Spoken Word Artist from my website successbeyondthescore.com. Okay, see you soon. Bye for now.